Hey, CM family, hope you're doing super well. I'm going to talk with you about time blocking and productivity, most importantly, workflow and work rhythms. This is something that I love learning about, and I love helping other people find more flow and more rhythm in their work. So I want to share with you a six principles, and they're so simple. Like they go back to, I think, year three at school six principles from about year three at school that will help you evolve your work rhythms now and forever. I refine my rhythms frequently and frequently probably looks like every couple of months. In fact, just on the weekend, I sat down to my diary on Sunday afternoon and I made a few little tweaks as to what my diary is going to look like moving forward so that I could get more rhythm and workflow so that I could be more present in the moment when I'm doing a certain task or engaging with a certain person, whether that be team or one of the members in the community. I want to be able to be present so that I can be productive, so that I can make progress, so that I can be effective. Now, I know for everyone here, we're all managing various demands, whether that's family and kids, whether that's um, your team, your clinic or clinic sites, your own life, your health, your well-being, your email, your inbox, your Slack, your Facebook, everything. Everything demands and wants your attention. So how do you take back an element of control and actually get some rhythm into your week. So I want to share with you my screen as we just walk through this here. For those of you that feel like, ah, heck, I haven't quite nailed my time blocking or I don't really have a lot of rhythm to my week, this is for you. And my message is that's okay because I haven't ever seen anyone say I have a fixed way of working and it's the way that I've structured my day and my week for decades. The reality is everyone's looking for that edge, that next evolution. The, the challenge is you hear or you see someone else and how they do their time blocking in their week and you take it and you try it on and it might work and it might not. And then maybe you get a little bit disappointed or frustrated that it didn't work for you or that it's increased your gains, but not by much. So I want to give you the six principles that allow you to really control and use your point of reference to evolve it in a better way always. Here they are. They're so simple. I'll share my screen. The power of technology is going to work. Not quite. Here we go. Yellow. Let's do this. The six principles are simple. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Remember I said year three, probably it was year three that I, I, I would have learned these things uh, about then. I'm sure someone in the community can correct me at what stage we learn this sort of stuff. Who, what, when, where, why, how. This is in no particular order, but let me walk you through it. What most people will do, and I know I've been guilty of this in the past and when I was really struggling to get this work rhythm and flow, was that you just focus on these two, the what and the when. What am I going to do in my week and when am I going to do it? An example being on Monday morning, I'm going to do finances. You've got what you're doing and when you are doing it. That's the starting point. That's good. But what we're missing is this structure and this substance that comes from the other elements of very purposeful time blocks and workflows. The key distinction here is that it is about achieving workflow, not having workload. Workload is, it feels heavy, it's on your desk, there's a lot of inertia, which requires a lot of effort, so you tend to procrastinate and you don't do it, versus workflow. The key ingredient is about constant movement and flow. The art of gaining momentum is keeping things in motion, flow. So how can you keep that task or that project moving? Because when it gets stagnant, it snowballs and it feels big and there's a lot of inertia and so it's harder to move later, hence why you typically procrastinate. So it's about the art of getting momentum and keeping things flowing and growing. 
So that might be, who can I delegate this to? Can I send an email, a text message? Uh, can I do a video, a phone call, a Zoom call, call a meeting? What can I do to move this thing onward? And then it might circle back to me at a later stage, but I want to keep it moving. That's the key. So that's the outcome is workflow over workload. And how we do that is using uh, these six principles over here. So the first one is the who. So often we become the solo hero when we sit down at our desk to figure out what this task or project is going to be. We try and write the system policy or procedure all by ourselves. Instead, who could help us? Who needs to be in the room? Whether that's a virtual room like Zoom or whether that's actually in the clinic with you, who could help us do this thing so that it stays in motion? Alternatively, who could we ask? Hey, Slack is a great place for you to ask your questions. If you're feeling a little bit stuck, ask in Slack and that keeps the ball mov moving. Someone could share a policy system or procedure or an experience that gives you a new insight or distinction that allows you to do that thing a whole lot better. So who could we help? Uh, who could help us? And who could we ask for some guidance? Next, where are we going to do this? This is one of the most profound but subtle shifts. I doubt very much that you are going to do important, deep mo uh, money or finance work in a hustle bustle cafe. Because there's so many noise, so many distractions, and for privacy, you probably don't want people seeing your screen. Now, I know there's going to be someone in this community that does it. But generally, we're not going to do our finances from a cafe where there's a lot of noise, a lot of people. I use that exaggerated example so that you can think about actually where am I physically for that time block? Because what I often see is that we might sit down at our desk maybe in your clinic room or in your office, and you do your marketing from there, your recruitment from there, you do your policies, systems, and procedures around clients from there, you do your finances from there, you do it all from the same place. And if we want to do inspired work, we've got to work from inspiring places or places that at least allow us to be in a state that is specific for the task of the project at hand. Hence why I use the example of a cafe and doing your numbers. Where are you? And this is the distinction that I think will really unlock things for you. Because if you want to do big picture thinking and planning, well, if you've got any mountains or hills close by, you might like to sit there so you literally have vision over the horizon. So you literally have no obstacles in your way and it's calmer, it's quieter, you can see and think big. You might like to be near water, the beach, a river, or a lake to do something similar. So where are you in your time blocks is a critical thing to consider. The why comes back to the three big areas that we've discussed before. It's starting with your blue sky vision or your painted picture. What does your clinic look like and what is your desire statement? That's why we do what we do. Then your strategic plan, that's your 120-day plan. The blue sky guides the 120 days because what's the next big thing we need to build, create, or refine to advance us towards the painted picture? And then that guides our operations. What are we actually doing on a daily basis? What is the system, the policy, the procedure? What is the actual thing that is rubber on the road on the ground floor? Because then that feeds back up to allow you to prioritize when you sit at your list of operational stuff on Asana, Trello, whatever it is, and you go, what should I do? Uh, I'm not sure where to start. I've got all these things on my desk. Again, feels like a workload. You've got to keep it in flow. And also how do you keep your mind in flow is coming back to what's the big picture? What's the strategic plan to prioritize my operations? Now, this last one is reserved for high performers, I would say. So what it means is you can get into workflow, you can be productive without doing this thing. If you want to do it in the short term, it makes it a little bit harder. In the long term, it makes you a lot better. The how. How do you actually show up 
to do each of those time blocks. Think of a pilot who flies a plane, Melbourne to Sydney, let's say. They've flown that plane thousands of times. They know how to fly it with their eyes closed. In fact, we probably autopilot. They don't even need to be in the plane. But they still, before every flight, go through the same monotonous checklist that they do every single flight to check that they are good to fly. And I always find it interesting when they hop on the, on the call before you're taxiing out and they say today's flight time is going to be 55 minutes, that they can tell it with almost a minute accuracy that you're touching down. Unless, of course, you're flying with Tiger, in which case, probably don't trust anything they say. Um, <laughs> so I'm always fascinated by that. And that's because they've got their checklist that they run through. No matter how advanced or experienced they are, they come back to a checklist of how they do that time. So when you come to your finances, do you actually have a checklist that you're running through that allows you to look over the fundamentals? and maybe even a decision-making criteria or a checklist of the things of how you're going to conduct yourself when you do that task. Now, this is why I said at the start, this takes a little bit longer and is reserved more for a high performer because a high performer, what they do amongst getting great results is they realize the value and the importance of the fundamentals and mastery over them. So even though they looked at that thing seven days ago, they're going to look over it again and tick that box if they're ticking that box. They're going to go through with a, a rigor around their numbers, around their planning. They're going to review their plan, even though I know what's on the plan. I'm going to look at the plan for half an hour on a Monday, get super clear on my focus, and then I'm way better during the week. So the how in the short term takes a little bit longer. And the professionals understand reflecting on and using a structure for that time, almost like you would in a consultation with a patient, you know that there's almost that bell curve of you're going to do the introduction and greeting, rapport, creation, then you get into a, maybe a history and then you get into uh, assessment, diagnosis, treatment, and then you're starting to land with action points. They know how to do that time with their business as well. They don't just rock up to their time block and go, uh, what am I going to look at? And then pull up a whole bunch of spreadsheets or plans or documents or open their emails. It's very controlled time. And it takes a level of accountability and uh, professionalism to do it. That's why I said it's not for everyone. You may work yourself into this position, but it is, it is uh, for the some who want to go to that next level, the how. These are some important distinctions for you then when you hear and see other people's time blocking to run it through your filter and go, okay, maybe I can test this out, but it's going to influence the where component or it's going to influence the how component of how I conduct myself. Or maybe it gives me a new filter for the who. So these are a few insights around time blocking and workflow versus workload to keep things in momentum and to make progress on the projects. Hope that helps and makes sense. If you have any questions, please do let me know. I love talking more about this stuff and I hope that you're finding more flow and more rhythm in your work every single week. All the best. Take care.